Yeah, last year I just come to the restaurant. It's called Burger She Wrote. We're trying to expand right now. I have, we have two now in LA, and we're trying to do Miami and New York. This is, this is like a, a Oklahoma burger from the Great Depression. This is like the fir very first actual sm smash burger. They would use onions to like stretch the meat. You get more bang for your buck, you know? He loves cooking. Everyone knows he's the master cook, but he's also like one of the most stylish skaters. He is so smooth. He has such good pop. Nuge is like a really psycho skater, first of all, and was a leader to like a whole group of skaters that we really liked. The thing about Nuge, he really is somewhat of a hero. He's the type of guy that, you know, if you have a problem or like a flat tire or something, like he's that guy that's like, I got you, let's get it fixed, you know? But he's just a boss, he's just a, a hero. They made a flyer, like he had a DJ night or something. It said, he Ali Del Toro, he bombed Baxter, he saved the Thrasher crew. And I was just like, that's totally true. He did all those things. What's up? Welcome back to Epically Lettered. Uh, we're starting this new season off. We've, it's been six years since the last one, or I don't know how many years. I think we started the show, gosh, it had to have been like almost 20 years ago. And Nuge seems to fit in with a lot of the characters I had on early episodes. A lot of Baker guys, Dustin Dolan, Braden, Spanky, Reynolds, Ellington. And I feel like Nuge fits right in. So it feels a little comfortable to me to have Nuge as an episode. I love his skating and I also love his vibe. He's someone I was excited about because he's just a sick homie to work with. And I just wanna meet up with him, talk to him about his skate career. Obviously there's the big things like uh, Ollie and El Toro, Baxter Street, getting in the crash with the Thrasher crew. Uh, we're at Nuge's restaurant, Burger She Wrote. Uh, so anyway, welcome back, Epically Later. You all nervous in front of the camera or what? We've already been doing this all day. So you've been nervous all day? Yeah. Tampa legs. Tampa legs? <laughs> yeah. It's just like, everything's fine until they call your name and you're like. <laughs> I think about his story a lot. His family was part of the post-Vietnam refugee program. Imagine hitting the ground from post-war Vietnam straight to Oklahoma City, and those kids like made a go of it, you know? This is what my dad taught me one day. What's... Yeah. I grew up in Oklahoma City. When I was born and until like five, it was just around Vietnamese people, you know? That was my first language, was Vietnamese. Like my dad, he escaped Vietnam. They were like, all right, there's a boat leaving. You got fuck, you're either on or you're off. So he was at work. Didn't even get to tell his family he was leaving. He just got on and left. And he didn't talk to his family for months after that, you know, cause like you couldn't write a letter back to Vietnam. Like they thought he was dead. And my mom's family got out because my, my grandpa worked for the embassy. So they had, a, they had an easy way out. They were like helicoptered out. Were your parents together in Vietnam? No, they met in Oklahoma. And then like for, when I was like five, my parents opened a pool hall. And that's kind of where I started skating in the park a lot. Around six years old is when I started skating. Because my brother was like five years older and he had like friends that skate. So I'd like be around them. We hadn't seen a video yet. You know, we're just like little kids and like me and him were just skating around in the park a lot. Learning how to ollie and shit. We were like, we called it a daisy because I didn't know what it was called. I never thought I was good or anything. It was just like fun, you know? I used to love jumping the stairs. I think people like me who grew up in California had it way different. Like growing up in Oklahoma must have been pretty hard sometimes. There was a large Asian community where I grew up. I can't even imagine what it would have been like out there. When I first met Daniel Shimizu, he was like an LA native, you know? And he was like, yeah, where are you from? And I was like, Oklahoma. And he was like, really? They got, they got Asians out there? <laughs> like, I had no idea. I was like, how, how did you survive? Are you like the only Asian dude in Oklahoma? I had like no idea. What's up, my name's Don Wynn. I'm from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I'm 17 years old. Right now, I don't have any sponsors. Uh, I like to skate ledges, stairs, and rails. Anything else I can find, that's it. Growing up in Oklahoma, like as an Asian dude, and then starting to skate pretty young, I yeah, kind of experienced a lot of like racism. Like even when I got older too, like as like a teenager and shit, like you'd be getting chased around by fucking like either jocks or like straight up cowboys and shit, you know. 
Yeah, like the first trip to California was just like four of us saved up like 200 bucks or whatever gas money to get there. And then it was like, I feel like I need to be here. And I loved it. Just seeing skaters, seeing skaters everywhere on every corner, you know, and like, I think I saved up like a hundred or a thousand bucks to move to California. That lasted fucking two seconds. So then you had to like find, you know, start working and stuff like that. And like, um, we were just kind of trying to live out here and skate. And yeah, I was definitely looking for a team to skate for. We were filming stuff and like, kind of like giving it to whoever, you know. I mean, that whole, the El Toro thing came about, like we were just like partying one night and like, I think Ragdoll might have said he wanted to ollie El Toro and then like, they were, we were just like kind of drunk. It gets kind of blurry, but they were there and they were like, yo, like fucking you should ollie it. And I was like, I'll go, fuck, I'll ollie it, you know, fucking whenever. Like, and they were like, let's go tomorrow. And I was like, okay. We went the next morning. I rolled up a few times. How I used to do it back in the day, like I'd roll up a few times, be like, okay, I'm gonna go back there and I'm not stopping this time. It's gonna, whatever happens, I'm going off. You know what I mean? I did it first try, it just, it worked out, I don't know. Like Joe Carlock, the guy that I filmed with the most at the time, brought a f photographer dude, and he shot it, but he shot a sequence of it, and like, I like flew, went out of the screen and then back in, you know, like, and he f missed the photo. I heard a kid, Ali Del Toro, and I was like, we gotta get that photo. I don't even know if we made plans. I think maybe it was like, we we're at the Huntington Beach High School Park, and someone's like, that's a kid that Ali Del Toro. And I was like, you wanna go back, get a photo? I just like tried it like four or five times, but didn't make it. I just stuck, but didn't right away. I think he landed a Baker Maker, but it's not the one that's in four on one, which you can tell because he's in a different outfit. This was so long ago, but I'm sure I was like, hey, you don't have to do this. This isn't, you know, like, cause anytime it's dangerous, I never like say like, dude, one more. You know, like it's always like, but he's like, it doesn't matter, we already did it, so we already got the footage, I just needed a photo of it. I remember seeing the picture in Thrasher, and that was a time where I was like, damn, Thrasher's getting good. Transworld, wish you had that one, you know? That was my first photo in any magazine, and it's funny, it's like, nobody knew who I was already, but then in the caption it was like, Dan Wynn. It wasn't even my name, it was <laughs> he misspelled it. Burnett swears to the day, he was like, I wrote your name perfectly clear, and something happened. There it is, actually. <laughs> Dan, Dan Wynn right here. I was already riding for Toy Machine Flow at the time and then Templeton had heard that I ollied El Toro. Yeah, I, I mean, he was basically gonna get on Toy Machine. I was flowing on boards, I thought he was great. Wait, you were there for El Toro? Was I? I don't think so. You're in the footage of him. Really? Sure. I was almost about to say I don't think I've even been to El Toro. But I guess You're I was. <laughs> I just remember having seen footage of him that I thought was really good. And I thought like, this is someone that I think we should put on Toy Machine. One day Ed came to us like, hey, there's this dude, he fucking rips. He's fucking hucking himself down all this shit. It was like a team decision. I had to like show the team everything. And I remember Brad Staba was just like, fuck this guy, he's got a piercing, like a chin, cause he had a little chin piercing right here whatever that's called, like through the, through the bottom lip there. Yeah, it might have been, could have been the piercing. <laughs> Man, you could be really, you know, um, it's super easy to be judgmental, isn't it? And so I really think he didn't get on Toy Machine ultimately because Brad wasn't stoked on the chin piercing. I, I, I kind of remember that though, yeah. Maybe I thought he should just ride for Foundation. I just felt like I was watching a Foundation video or something. Cataclysmic Abyss. That was my first real video part too, so like, I was super stoked about it. And that era was like the fuck, it was so fun. And I was skating with like, Corey Duffel a lot of the time. Foundation was, um, especially back then, it was like the indie rock band, or more like the rock and roll band of skateboarding. When I got to California, it was kind of like, started slowly getting more and more hash, I guess. I don't know, like what happened. 90s, early aughts, people were not wearing like tight Levi's or rock and roll hair. I guess you had to do this. You had tight pants with some poofies, you know? <laughs> I always get confused like with other Asian people, actually. Like I get confused with Jerry all the time. And I'm like, how is that even possible? We like, don't even look anything alike. He has like long hair. I was work, uh, working at Supreme and like uh, Christian Osoy comes in and skates the bowl. He got, must have got crossed up, but he was like, Jerry, fucking Jerry, fucking thanks for letting me skate the bowl. And I'm like, fuck it, I'm gonna let this ride. I'm Jerry right now. I was at like the Hollywood Farmer's Market and 
Like I stopped to get a coffee. The guy was like, obviously hooking me up. He was just like, you know, chatting me up and being really nice and he gave me free coffee. But then the cup said Nuge on it. <laughs> but yeah, Don is just one of those guys. I feel like he gets along with everybody. Like he always had a spot for me, sleeping on the floor of the old Hell Rose place. We all had different apartments in it and it looked like Melrose place, but we were just partying all the time. Hell Rose was a house and a crew of guys that definitely were influenced by, by early Baker and just straight rockers, like honestly, and like really living it, you know? All we did was skate, that's it. Like literally skate, party, skate, party. There was nothing else, like, you know. I lived across the street from Hell Rose. I remember one winter, like they didn't have heating and there's like windows broken out. So they just decided to burn skateboards as like firewood. The fumes were just so toxic because it's just like the glue that holds the wood together and the grip tape. I was like, what the fuck are you guys doing, man? Nudes always made sure like everybody had a good time. We would cruise up and we'd go skate. He'd cook us these top shelf dinners and kind of rad out. He'd just kind of open the doors and let us just hang out. He was just kind of like the boss. He's almost like a Hell Rose boss, basically. So at some point we kind of adopted some of them. And I'd say Lizard and Slash were the first, like, from that crew. I always thought it was funny because New just, like, Ted Nugent, yeah. Lizard King is like a fucking Jim Morrison, <laughs> and Slash just comes around. And, and, like, these dudes have the nicknames of, like, other people that already have the <laughs> I don't know how that happened. I think, I mean, Slash is because he was always, like, going so fast and, like, fucking, he'd, like, skidding around corners. He was going so fast. And so it was like, he's just slashing around, like, and it just became Slash. Mine became, came because my name was spelt crazy and like was unpronounceable, I guess. And Richie just said, you're Nuge now. And I was like, all right, whatever. And it just stuck somehow. And then Lizard, he just looked like a lizard, came from Utah out of nowhere, you know? There's been a phone call like, hey, Lizard, it's Rodent. I'm with Cricket. And you're like, what the fuck? What are these names? You know, like if someone from the outside world heard that, they'd be like, what? Because of Jim, we run everything like as if it's the mob. Like that's like just because of Jim Greco, and that's what we do. So there's a lot of like those rules. So it was Baca, Slash, Lizard. Yeah, bitch. He's the boss of that whole crew. So after we had Slash and Lizard, and I saw how they all reacted to Nuge, and I'm like, dude, we gotta, we gotta get Nuge. I remember being on a trip and we're driving back and I got a call and Reynolds was like, hey, I talked to all the dudes and uh, I think, you know, all your friends are here. I think you should just ride for Baker. And I was like, yeah, right, and just hung up. I thought it was like a prank call, but everybody that would be pranking me, I would look back and they were all like asleep. So I was like, what the fuck? And then it rang again and I was like, fuck yeah, I, I'm in. You got snagged up by Baker. And you know, as hard as it was to see no very good friend leave, it's like, dude, they're gonna pay you more and there's a big opportunity at 30 years old. I can take it, dude. I got on Baker when I was 30, like pretty late in the game, you know, like, I don't think anybody's, I don't know, putting 30 year olds on teams now, I don't know, but I was pretty stoked about that. On Baker, it was like Reynolds, Spanky, everybody, Theodos, it was like fucking 20 people, you know, like, and we still had the skate tank, the van. So it was like a fucking, it was the sickest shit because like Beagle would just come by and he would just pick all of us up one at, one at a time, like picking the people up from school. Like uh, he's driving a school bus, just cruising around LA like we're on a skate trip, but we're just in LA and just hitting every spot. And somebody like, where do you want to skate? And he's like, uh, Wilshire. I'm like, okay, cool. It was so sick. I think me and Sammy would always share a part in the bigger videos. I think we're just like best friends and like, so we'd always be at the spot together, you know, like, so it's kind of like just made sense to be like us together. Yeah, the part of Baca and Nugent, Bacon Destroy, is really sick. Front pop shove it over, handrail down into the bank. The things that he does, you go to in person and you're like, ah, it's like way worse than I <laughs> expected, you know what I mean? It, it always seemed like, yeah, just an official thrill-seeking stuntman skater, you know? He's like most known for that stuff, but he can, he also like could like, frontside heel flip a table. That's one of the hardest tricks to do on flat ground and he did it over a table, like, and well. Like, you wanna pigeonhole him into one of these dudes who are not that skilled but will just, you know, eat shit and go for something big. No, Nuge just like a ballerina on a board. Like, it is so beautiful. Nuge has an ability to like leap really far, take really high impact. 
I mean, that's just the thing with Nuge too, is like if you dare that fool to do something, he's probably gonna do it. But that's pretty much what happened with Baxter Street. We were at like a Skin Phillips photo show and it was some scenario where it was like neck face hyping it up and he's like, yo, Nuge said he's gonna bomb this hill. If Nuge bombs Baxter, are you there to shoot it? And I'm like, fuck yeah. So I go to Nuge at the same party, I just like turn around, Burnett's right there and Nuge is over there. I was like, hey, Burnett said he'll give you the cover if you bomb that hill. And I was like, Okay. Went back to Burnett and I was like, hey, he said he wants to do it tomorrow. Like he set it up, like he played us both. So I was like, yeah, fuck yeah, we'll be there. So it was like the plan, you know, and that's fun too to like have that kind of stuff. So it was like the next, next day we're meeting up. Yeah, he was at the top. Tina was kind of coaching him at the top. I was like, dude, don't fucking do this fucking hill. It is like hectic. And like you're partying last night. It's like, it's fucked. There's a photo of like a bus at the top stuck. Did you see the Tesla footage? Yeah, yeah, it was awesome. It's a 32% grade, which means it's very steep and also a very bad idea to do anything aggressive with a vehicle here. So these are some of these old 1930s streets. Those hills were so steep that they couldn't pour asphalt because the asphalt would just slump while it was hot. So they had to pour it in concrete straight up, like no zoning code would allow this. And I'm on the other hill, like coming, it's like a half pipe. So I'm on the other hill looking down, looking over. He did like halfway a couple times. It's almost like it's a snowboard video and you can't really tell how fast they're going until they get close to you. I actually filmed Baxter. And it was like the furthest I ever had to zoom in on my camera. Like, and when it's that zoomed in, it's like sensitive, you know? So it was so steady, it was just holding my breath, like. <gasps> and then I was gonna go up and do it halfway again, and on the way up, I was walking up, and I heard like a, a car was going down, and I heard like a kid was in the back seat. She was like, you're gonna die. I went to the top, I was like, fuck it. down in the history books. People have been like doing it since or whatever, but Nuge gets full points because he did it first. He's just like a really good skater, but on a trip is where he really shines because he's like driving the van, first guy up, and I'm talking like the pile times where everyone's just like making a scene everywhere we go. And it's like, Baker Death Wish tour and like people are getting arrested and stuff and like the, the crew is a fucking mess. And Nuge is just there like shotgun like with a joint ready before everyone, keeping everything clean, but not in like a type A way. Yeah, and it's like you lead by example, you know. If you're ready and enthusiastic and like this is what we're doing, every, the other guys go, oh, this is what we're doing. But being able to like be with all the psychos and wordlessly like keep shit in order is like absolutely a superpower. Wait, you weren't there when the van crashed. Mm, no, thank God, no. But yeah, you saved so many lives. I love music, and I, like I love playing music. And when skate rock was happening again with like Thrasher and shit, like Jake was like, yo, Put a band together, we're gonna go and you just play shows and skate and do whatever. We are on Skate Rock South Africa. We were going from like, I think Durban to Johannesburg or something like that. I was driving the van. Our van probably has like 20 people in it. Definitely over Capas. Half a Thrasher magazine was in there. The nickname of the town we were in was called 
the land of a thousand hills. There was this skate camp in the middle of all these mountains that we were trying to get to. P-Stone's like, hey, stop at the store, I'm gonna get some beer. There was a local in there and P-Stone made friends with them. And This dude jumps in the van that's already full. He's like, this guy's got the route, he knows the shortcut. And I'm like, well, we don't need a shortcut. The map says just go here, it's fine. Right when we turned down this road, I was like, holy fuck. We were on like a regular ass paved road. And then now we're turned onto this road that's just like straight red dirt. You look over the edge and it's just like a cliff. It's just straight down into the valley of a thousand hills. Hell no, there's no seatbelts in these. Dude, this van was sketchy. And I can feel the brakes, like they're like kind of giving out. I'm like pushing it down all the way to the floor. And I'm like, fuck. I was in the very back seat. I remember I heard Nuge. He said it kind of loud, but but quiet. Brakes went out. Yeah, never fuck. He brakes out. Like I, I thought he was joking. I just hear P-Stone going, slow and low, Nuge. Slow, low, slow, low, Nuge. Use that E-brake. We had this whole thing, we'd always be like, slow and low, slow and low. It was like the, the motto of the, the trip. We'd be barbecuing, and we'd be like, slow and low. Uh, slow and low, slow and low, slow and low, Luke. I, can't, I, can't, I, can't. I just see a fork like this, and you just see like, oh shit, we go straight, we're going right through the butt crack, and we're gonna die. And the last second I saw like a little left that kind of went up a little bit. And Nuge, seriously, like last second, was like, fuck it, I'm going left. Boom, hits the left. It was like a, a, a gate, so I couldn't see what was on the other side. I was just like, maybe this gate will slow us down. Just smashed through the gate, did nothing. Chickens and pigs and shit are fucking running out of the way. Like it was somebody's like farm or some shit, dude. They're going, ah. Now I'm seeing like a yurt here, a yurt here, and a yurt here. And, and I'm like hauling ass, barely hanging on to the fucking van. Just like, you know, we're just like bumpy and fucking turning and sliding. And then I see that the yurt, I'm like, well, I, I, this is it. I have to crash into this thing. I remember looking and there was a lady breastfeeding uh, her baby right there in front of this yurt. She just, goes that way, like crosses the van, and I like, one second later, it's like, boom! Everyone fucking flies forward. Hey, you all right? Dude, you all right? Okay. You good? I'm good, I'm good, good. Dude, you good? Get me out, get me out. Got it. Tony? That was a board that hit you, Tony. All right. I couldn't make it, there was no, there was no way. Brakes are now. All right, dude. How'd that happen? Brakes are ready to go out here? Brakes went out. Brakes went out. And her chair is like right, and there's footage of it, and the chair is right next to where the van like landed. Holy shit. We all piled out, and now like the, like we're in like a village. People are coming out from the like hillsides. I'm like, oh man, they're so sorry. And we're like, don't worry, we'll fix the house. We got it. And they're like, don't worry about it. Is everybody okay? They're like checking to make sure everybody's okay. Yeah. Holy shit. I had to go left. No, you pulled it. You pulled I had to go news. left. He pretty much chose to take it on his side and the whole van kind of caved in on him instead of going left and taking out P-Stone or risking killing everybody in the van and driving off the cliff. We all get out of the van and Jake is still in there. We all look in the van and see Jake and he's just fucking laughing. He's just like, like laughing like holy shit, like we could have just died. Like Nuge straight up saved all our lives and all Jake could say was like, that would have been a sad day for Borden. He's like, if, it, if we all would have died, that would have been a sad day for boarding. He always talked about that when everyone's on the plane to the contest. He's like, this thing goes down on the way to Tampa. <laughs> the day the music died. Like there was like skater of the years, future skater of the years, fucking in that van and Phelps. It would have been like devastating if that would have happened, you know? So I wrote this whole piece about him being like a real life superhero. He Ollie Del Toro, he bombed Baxter, he saved the Thrasher crew. It's like, how many people have those kind of real concise things, especially saving everybody, you know? <laughs> Don Nguyen, real life superhero. I didn't get taken out by injuries, but like, um, growing up skating all those drops and stuff like that, I thought I'd be like way worse than I am, but I'm pretty good. The reason I don't skate as much these days is like, you know, I'm busy with the restaurant. 
it's just like hard to find time, but like, uh, I mean, I still skate when I can, you know? I put extra onions because I love, I love onions. His transition into like these later years of the pro skate career has just been really smooth and seamless because someone like Nuge, you just want him around, so you're not like, hey, fucking pack it, pack it up. Like, you're, he's not a space waster. That period of transition is really hard for a lot of people, and you see people who take their connections and their experiences and their friends and like turn it into their next phase, and then you see the guys who are just like kicking and screaming, don't want to be done. Professional skating has a lifespan. That's just what it is. Like, some people don't want to accept it, some people do. You know, um, he's to me a huge part of Baker, and it's like something, you know, what, one of these situations like a legendary pro that's always part of the of the brand. You know, Spanky, Lissa Steamer, Nuge. There could come a time where you know he has some opportunity to open a restaurant or open this, and and we need to make a Nuge board for that certain situation, like those kind of things. You know what I mean? Where he's like he's part of our crew and like our history. I think he's got enough irons and enough fires that he's gonna be good. You know, that's the thing about Nuge. Like, everything he does, he does great. He didn't just phase out of skating and kinda do whatever. He's been very active on doing other things. Yeah, I have like 10 jobs, basically. I work at Supreme four days a week. You get insurance, you get money. The restaurant, every day I go there before work, after work. Show face, say what up to the dudes. DJ all the time. We're starting a beer company skate, play music. He's just a cool ass dude with a bunch of shit going on. And it's just like, what the fuck? <laughs> Whether he's on the board doing stunts or, or just life hammers, he's just a successful, he's a winner. Nuge is a winner. I lived with Atiba for a while and I would see like his work ethic. He's like, I just want to do as much shit as I can. It kind of resonated with me and I was like, all right. I don't like sitting still, I guess, you know? I could sit still for like a, a day, maybe. And then I'm like, well, I, fucking, I missed something. Like I, I, you know, like something happened somewhere and I fucking missed it. You know, like I wanted, I just want to keep going. Yeah, so he'll tell you about bombing Baxter Street and Ollie and El Toro too. He'll, he'll tell you all that. You don't even got to ask him. He just brings it up. He's like, you know how Ollie and El Toro, right? You know how I bombed Baxter. <laughs> It's like, dude, what? <laughs>